Thomas, uh, just recently, IFAD brought together a larger group of donors and practitioners to set up a framework which looks at harmonizing monitoring and evaluation of food security programs, looking specifically at learning. Uh, what's the overall aim of this framework, and where do you see the strategic functionality within the many food security projects out there? We started this initiative initially with about seven institutions, and it has grown to uh, 10 plus uh, organizations. And what brought these institutions together was a shared concern with uh, food security. So that is something we share. Um, but of course, we have different mandates, very different instruments, um, uh, but we're all concerned about results. We're all concerned about um, accountability, all very much interested and concerned about learning. We want to know what works, where, how, and why, and what can be scaled up. But we're also concerned at the same time that that costs money. Learning costs money. And when we then realize that we each learn our own things over and over again, and we learn the same things, it's a bit of a waste of, of opportunities and a waste of, of resources. So we believe that partnership can lead to better learning and more cost effectiveness of that learning. So that is why with that conviction that shared learning enhances the speed, the breadth, and the cost effectiveness, that's why we took this initiative. Now, basically we all have in our programs M&E units, and that of course taxes very scarce capacities, very scarce resources. At the country level, we have a lot more scope to be Paris Declaration compliant using national systems even when we do that m and &E work. So the whole idea of this uh, partnership is about joint m and &E activities based on share indicators linked to national systems, enhance the learning, make it more cost effective, and make it more country owned. Now when we say that we share uh, indicators, that we share um, uh, M&E systems, of course, the precondition for that is that we also come to an agreement on results change, and that has to be linked to the, the underlying theory of change for the uh, impact evaluations that we want to do, and that is what the food security learning framework, the document that you are referring to, actually does. It summarizes the shared implicit theory of change between these institutions that gives us the basis for identifying these indicators uh, around rural transformation driven by the global concern for food security. So the, um, the, strategic, function, the strategic function of that um, partnership, therefore, is essentially enhanced learning, but also a little bit of a pilot effort to harmonize amongst a few of us demonstrating that harmonization can work, that sharing uh, systems, sharing indicators, sharing learning, uh, that it can work, and hopefully, and that is the strategic uh, aspiration we have, if we can show that it can work among seven to ten institutions, why can it not work with a broader partnership? With that framework uh, in there, you also want to prioritize certain questions that you find critical for improving food security programming around the world. Um, how is the M&E Harmonization Group planning to answer the questions that you come up with? The core principle is that we would try to share um, or engage into joint M&E activities around shared indicators. So we sit down. We look at our indicators and we try to see how that matches, that we, we share that theory of change in the FSLF, the food security learning framework. But then, of course, you don't change the world overnight. We, we then um, go ahead and, within the context of our own programs, carry out our MNE and especially our impact evaluation work. Now, of course, in some of our projects, we already have partnerships with the institutions that are in the food security learning framework partnership, okay? So in that case, it's easy. We start from the beginning with joint activities because we are partners in the project.
But in other co countries, in other programs, we are in standalone mode, and therefore we do our own thing based on the shared indicator, shared theory of change. We answer the questions, and then we, we uh, through that, that uh, setup that we have of the partnership, we then share this, um, the, the findings of um, our m and &E activity, whichever it is, whether it is monitoring or impact evaluation or any other activity, we share it so that uh, others can learn from it, both in terms of methodology as well as a substantive content of the learnings. I've read into this is quite a substantial document, one would assume, obviously. And there I find there's also this uh, rather typical identification of knowledge gaps. It's basically, you know, the, the idea that, that there's obviously a lot of knowledge out there and it's not applied everywhere in all the projects as far as I understand. Um, I sometimes get the idea there are maybe more gaps that one can handle, actually. So I sometimes wonder, wouldn't it be better to identify just the worst common practices out there, expose them, and pointing to better practices, or is that maybe also part of your approach? You're absolutely right. The way the, each one of the eight dimensions of the food security learning framework is structured is that we, we have a bit of a narrative that states what the challenge is, what, what the problem is. Uh, we then have that second part, which um, tries to highlight the key knowledge gaps, the key questions that need to be answered, and we've tried to restrain ourselves to five. And then, of course, we have the indicators that would help us respond to these questions. Now, you can imagine with a wide range of institutions um, that it was extremely difficult to agree what each one of us feels to be the most important knowledge gap because we have different mandates, different priorities. So I can assure you that we, we probably, and I, I forget now when we started, we, we, for each of these areas, we must have had something like 20 questions that we each wanted to have our answers on. And then we worked for several months to agree on what is the minimum five that uh, we should try to answer. Just wondering about the completion of the framework. The group plans to conduct a, a mapping of all the M&E activities, as far as I read, in, in, in at least one pilot country. And the candidates for that are Bangladesh, Ghana, Tanzania. What were the criteria for selecting especially these countries? Uh, and what are the advantages of mapping these countries? What will be done there? We have actually gone ahead with two countries, uh, Ghana and Tanzania with Bangladesh uh, following very rapidly. Now, um, the first criterion was, of course, that each one of our institutions, the 10, the 10 institutions involved now, have a very large program there. Okay, so it is the presence of the institutions, the size and the nature of the program. Okay, it does it, is it related to food security? Is it related to rural transformation? But also, um, the, the quality of the program, the learning quality of that program. So that was the first criterion that we have, and all three countries complied with that. The, the second criterion was um, our own experience with how much the government wants to be in the lead of uh, harmonizing the donors, offering a, a, a country-level strategic framework for food security, with indicators so that we have something that we can harmonize towards. So the country leadership was important. And I have to confess that um, because of our attempt to link our m and &E systems to national m and &E capabilities, statistical capabilities, um, we also took note um, or took into account the assessments by FAO and by uh, the U United States uh, Office of Statistics, um, the assessment of the statistical capabilities in the country, uh, statistical capabilities, but also the mandates of the statistical office. And all three countries um, respond to that. The purpose of the mapping then is within the framework that these governments provide us, uh, we map our activities. Uh, it starts with mapping the project who is doing what, where, and how. And then we, 
we drill down further on what have we done in these different programs in terms of m and &E setup, indicators, and there we then start identifying with a toothpick, literally, uh, the opportunities for collaboration. And, and then the next step uh, is, of course, to actually plan the joint action. Because if we have, let's say, uh, that five of us would be working in the same district in Tanzania, and we have each one of our, our m and &E units, that's the, that's the starting point for bringing that together into a harmonized way. Are you mapping only government-run programming, or are you uh, mapping practices per se? We are mapping programs where uh, at least one of us, uh, and definitely if we are joint partners in a program, are engaged in. Uh, now, the, the interesting bit is that, for instance, one of our partners is the Gates Foundation. They are working directly with the private sector and with civil society organizations. Institutions like NEPAD do also a little bit of that, but works more through, through the government. Um, so it's a, a mixed bag, but ultimately um, what we hope is, and I'll take the example again of a district in Tanzania, when we do the mapping of our activities in the context of the government strategy for that particular district, we will of course come across other important initiatives by institutions that are not partners, and we will of course not miss that opportunity to talk to them and see how we can bring them together. I know from a previous interview with your colleague Sheikh Surang, which was about the Scaling Up project, that actually, talking about the evidence, that only a very small number of projects currently is actually scaled up. Um, so from that point of view, the impact evaluations are certainly a, a critical tool, and uh, intuitively it sounds very reasonable uh, that we need to scale up um, what provisions do you, do you take to ensure that the impact in valuations will be reflected in future design? Do you have any sort of leverage there, or is it just about uh, you know, informing the right people and, and, and trying to convince them? Is there, in a way, an impact evaluation of your tool, impact evaluation, if you will? This is why... Uh, we in IFAD, uh, but also several of our other partners in the group, have basically taken a decision that uh, impact evaluations should not simply be um, a study carried out by IFAD on a specific project. Mm -hmm. We need to have the projects themselves doing the baseline, doing the midterm survey, and looking what happens and then doing the completion survey. The second level is, of course, at the, at the national level, because the project is area-specific, is then that the governments borrow resources, they decide, the finance minister, the agriculture minister decides to allocate significant amounts of resources to monitoring and evaluation and to impact evaluation. They want to see the findings of this. And we support the, the, the process of bringing this to the policy makers have a discussion with them on what it means, not just for that project, but also for br a broader policy formulation. So we are using the impact evaluation to help governments think through what policy changes, what changes in their own strategic framework could lead to enhanced effectiveness because of scaling up of successful programs. Then beyond the country level, it comes back into EFAD and through the partnership with other institutions where um, the, we have, of course, different review uh, systems here in the house. We have a technical advisory division that are eagerly looking forward to evidence-based knowledge. We have worked with knowledge uh, for a long time. Every single uh, program design, every single uh, project completion review has a large section on lessons learned. Every three years, we will be summarizing the findings of our evaluations that we do, and that will then be one of the uh, inputs into the formulation of EFAT's own uh, corporate strategy for, for the future. So there's many different layers um, and also different temporal uh, frameworks to integrate the findings of strong evidence-based knowledge 
uh, into uh, program design and into policy design. Okay, so thank you very much, and we're looking forward to the next uh, status report interview. I thank you very much for the opportunity.